The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and Flight Bridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey everybody, Eric back with you. This evening we're actually going to do a podcast on the road and i uh, got my good buddy Dave Olvera here with me. Uh, we're teaching a course in Gunnison, Colorado. Um, had a very eventful drive in the other day. It was <laughs> kind of hit uh, sleet and, and ice and windshield was freezing over. And, you know, I just uh, a week before I was in Las Vegas with 100 degree temperatures and then went back to Kentucky and it was 33 and then went to Minneapolis and it was 20 and then, man, I've just been all over. So then I landed in Denver and I've got my puffy jacket because I'm preparing for <laughs> a snowstorm and, and sure enough, it started out like that. So I want to welcome Dave back to the show. Uh, everybody, I've talked about Dave. I've had Dave on the uh, show twice and we've had a lot of great reviews. So I wanted to kind of introduce him uh, in a more formal manner. Uh, he's going to be doing more courses with us and uh, um, has become an integral part of our team. And so, you know, I feel like we've really surrounded ourselves with uh, an amazing group, uh, starting with, you know, my wife and we have Mike Rakest and we have Dave Olvera and Bruce Hoffman and Tyler Cristofoli, um, just to name a few. And then just so blessed to have added Dr. Dan Davis to our, to our team. And uh, so slowly going to integrate and introduce each one of these phenomenal providers, clinicians to you, the listeners, um, wanted to do a podcast and kind of get his research out there. We talk about the research all the time. We, I quote his research and, and, you know, why not have him talk about what he's been doing and kind of his passions. And we did a podcast, actually, we, we had to look this up this afternoon. Uh, we did a podcast in December, 2015, and he introduced kind of this, uh, this new thought process that, um, I'll let him explain on what's called the heaven criteria. Now that's published. And so real proud of him for getting that published. And so we wanted to kind of explain everything about that. I want to have him explain kind of his background and, and how he's got to where he's got and why he's so passionate about airway management. So I want to welcome Dave and, and uh, kind of let him take the, take the mic. Well, thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. You know, it's uh, very flattering to hear the words you said, and uh, I appreciate all the support that uh, the listeners and yourself have done to help uh, spread the word on the airway management and what we're doing to improve outcomes for our patients. Uh, it's uh, it's not without the help of the 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 um, the listeners to help spread the word to make this happen, where we're changing practice in medicine and improving patient outcomes. Uh, so you're right. We started this idea about heaven criteria. Um, we found that, um, you know, the, our traditional assessment was lemon or lemons as with saturations. Uh, and we found that it is a phenomenal, uh, technique for the, uh, operating room experience. Um, but when we get into ourselves into an emergency setting, it sometimes, um, can be difficult to achieve all the mnemonic. So we find that the L look externally is pretty easy to do. Now, when we evaluate the three, three, two rule. We have to put three fingers of the patient's fingers in their mouth. That's kind of hard to do when they may be semi-conscious or combative. Uh, and then trying to find the, uh, the, the points below can be difficult in continuing the three and the two. Um, melon potty. You know, melon potty is an incredible tool that we can use to assess, assess airways. But in the emergent setting, we find that it becomes more and more difficult. And in reality, we have to think to ourselves, when's the last time we did a live melon potty on a patient in the pre-hospital setting? It's very hard to find. And then we have uh, the rest of our mnemonic, and, and we know that. We see our obstructions and neck mobilities, and those two uh, can be uh, something that we can assess and we can look at. And then there's the S for saturations and trying to keep them above 93%. Uh, you know, there was one great study that was done by uh, Dr. Zernick uh, and her team where they looked at a it was called the correlation of Leon, L-E-O-N, assessment and successful endotracheal innovation in the pre-hospital air medical operations. And they did look at this study, and they found that the Leon tool could be assessment, uh, could be effective. But again, the difficulty with the 
uh, the E part of the assessment can um, can uh, be um, difficult. So we challenged this uh, within our company and with uh, Dan Davis's guidance, uh, at Dr. Dan Davis's guidance, and we found that you know uh, there was a quote by Dr. Walls that said it follows the evidence based guidelines for prediction of difficult videoscopic innovation may be challenging or even impossible to develop. And I, I sat with that. I read that and I sat with that and I sat with that and I thought about it and I said, there's got to be a way. There has got to be a way. And so Dr. Davis and I were uh, toying with some different ideas and he's really good at making mnemonics catchy. And he came up and uh, said, well, let's try heaven. And what we did is we looked at our airway database and we found in our airway database that there are specific reasons and why we fail. And we found that these were uh, happening over and over and over again. And we said, okay, if we can correct these reasons or anticipate these reasons, then we should have a better opportunity for preventing uh, having a negative outcome or a difficult intubation. And so that's kind of how the history of it started and where we started with things. Well, and I think when you when you started in and started talking about the lemons, a couple of thoughts came to mind. And, and you said it was built for the OR, the anesthesia suite. And what happens prior to any procedure, any surgery? There's a there's a pre-op mm-hmm. appointment usually the day before where either that anesthesiologist or a CRNA, somebody comes and it's usually the anesthesiologist is going to be taking the case. And but they they do a quick assessment like that. And so they have they have a controlled environment. They can hit on some of those things prior. And I so I think that that's brilliant in looking at not the status quo and arguing there's got to be a better way. And and so I, I love that. And so before we kind of get into this, I do want to congratulate you. And, and and many people don't really realize this, but Dave was actually awarded the International Flight Paramedic Association's Tim Hines Award two years ago. Big honor. And what award did you just get? You got the John Jordan Award for Journalism through the Air and Surface Transport Nurse Association. And so very, very proud of you. Um, and that's a testament to your hard work and research, um, both – domestically and internationally because you've spoke all over the world. Um, and so, you know, I want Flatbridge to be a platform that's not about Eric, not about Eric Bauer, not about, you know, what I want. I want it to be get the most relevant information out to our providers that, that makes a difference immediately, an immediate impact on our, on our industry. And obviously you've received those awards because of those types of impacts that you've had already on the industry. So I just want to say, you know, among all of our listeners, how proud of I am and how proud all of us at Flatbridge Jet are of, uh, of your accomplishments. And, and we're so happy that you're part of our team. Well, thanks, Eric. It's a, it's a huge honor to receive the awards. And again, to be on the podcast, to, to hear you say that, it's, um, I'm without words. So let's kind of move on and, and look at you just got this published. Mm-hmm. So this was just published. I want to talk about that. And I don't think people realize, you know, I'm, I'm doing a research project. Um, I'm so darn busy that, that I've, I've just broke the ground on it. Um, but there's so much involved in research and there's so much dedication. There's so many burning the, the midnight, midnight oil, I mm-hmm. guess is what, what, what you'd call it. But there's so much stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And so, you know, this, this has been a, a couple year project. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so you finally got it published. And so can you talk about that? And let's kind of jump into um, the type of study, kind of explain the type of study. And then we did a podcast. If you're new to research, go back to the podcast I did on how to reach a, read a study, because I that, think that's very, very important. Um, and so if you could kind of enlighten our listeners on that stuff. Sure. So it was a um, retrospective study using our data registry. Uh, our current re- data registry carries about 159 data points, and we have over 7,000 live intubations uh, that we use in this registry. Within that registry, we look at our heaven criteria. We look at uh, basically, in short, I can paint the picture of how the intubation went and how the airway management went just by reading the data registry. We see uh, what kind of RSI medications they used, uh, the type of patient it is, the age. Uh, we look at um, 
what worked on their first attempt? Did they raise the head of the bed? Did they use suction? Did they use an RSI checklist? And so we look at all these different covariables to see what's going on with that airway management and see what's working and what's not working. And then at the end of the year, we do an update for our clinicians every year and kind of say, here's what's working, here's what's not working. But again, uh, we use this uh, for heavy emphasis in our heaven criteria and, and validating it and showing that um, where the uh, uniqueness of the lemon criteria in the operating room setting, this shared the opposite of the uniqueness of the out of operating room experience. So what we mean by that is it's not just a pre-hospital thing. It's not just a flight thing. It's the emergent airway. And what are we doing to take care of it? So this can be in the ICU, it can be in the ER. There, there, there's no, and it can be in the OR too for the emergent airway. Uh, I think um, we we tend to joke a lot about um, the controlled environment of the operating room, but that's not all their patients. They have some extremely sick patients and they have to be extremely creative and uh, well-trained to do what they do. And it's 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 amazing to work with them and learn about what they're doing uh, and seeing that happen. And uh, with that, it helps build the opportunity for us in the pre-hospital setting to maximize and improve what we're doing in our process. Well, and I think what you said again brings up a great point that the heaven criteria brings diversity. And where where I, I think where my mind went when you first started talking about lemons is I just don't think that's a very diverse acronym because I, I do think it's very isolated. It's not for that emergent patient. So I love that you guys came up with an acronym and you hit on the core reasons why airways um, – I should say, why there's airway failures. And I think a lot of times we can prevent that. I know I've heard you speak, and I speak on this at every review course or whether I'm speaking at conferences. And I think the key thing is the whole adage of be proactive, not reactive. And I think that that is where the heaven criteria comes into play is trying to predict that difficult airway and go through and identify those core resuscitation points that are going to be that silent killer. Mm -hmm. What what can you identify prior to um, going down that pathway so you're proactive in your care? Right. Um, and so based on that, based on kind of the those kind of talking points, how do you utilize heaven criteria? What's the the basis? Is it a is it a point system? Or do you just have your providers go through and identify? core aspects based on each letter. Can you explain kind of sure. how that works? So uh, we looked at three different strategies. First, we looked at patients with a heaven criteria that were compared to no heaven criteria in terms of laryngoscopy view. Second was the relationship between the heaven criteria and then the view itself and looking. And when we said what we had is a um, difficult view versus a good view. And uh, the third part of this was a multiple logistic regression used to explore the independent relationship between each of the criteria. And so what we said is a difficult view is a CL view of a two, I'm sorry, a three or a four. And a good view is a, as a one or a two. And so what we found that when we looked at that information is this is how we kind of broke down and said, did we have a good view? Did we have a difficult view? How did the heaven criteria mix in with this? And we looked at it not just at the, the videoscopic portion, but we looked at direct and video. Uh, and we looked at them individually, and then we um, ran through the data that way. So can you kind of go through what is what is CL, what is DL, what is VL? Can sure. you just for the listeners, just so we you know make sure we hit on that? Absolutely. So CL is your Cormac Lehane view. So it's the view you see of your airway. Uh, it goes grade one to grade four. Uh, grade one is you know the all encompassing best view you can see. We found with our research that. Um, with videoscopic intubation, sometimes a grade two view can be more successful than a grade one view, and that's basically because of the angulations of the cameras that we're looking at. Uh, DL is direct laryngoscopy, and VL is our videoscopic intubation. Uh, we are fortunate to use a device that is a normal geometric blade, and what that means is that if you hold it against a traditional direct laryngoscopy blade, the curvature matches what the curvature is for that blade. And so we can do what's called a crossover technique where we can initiate the intubation with video and say we can't see it and transition and crossover to direct or vice versa. We can initiate it with, uh, with direct and switch over to video in the same attempt 
And when we do that, it increases our success in our defined difficult airways about 11%. So it really helps us out with that. All right. So let's go back to the grade two view. Explain why. And so uh, there was a few points. Um, obviously, when, when you look at a scale of one to four, and you're talking about the Cormac Leane, um, you would think that a grade one would be most optimal. You have perfect view of the vocal cords. Absolutely. But I think if you if if you are a provider out there and you've never used a video to learn to scope, I think that is the first thing I, I realized when I first used the CMAC was holy cow, your technique is completely different. You can't just bury that blade. Mm-hmm. You have to inch your way down, right direct, you know, left to midline or, or I guess right of midline. Um, and so is it the zoom? Is there a zoom issue? Is that why? Can you kind of explain sure. that in more depth? Yeah, and when it comes down to it, once you you practice both using video and direct, the techniques stay the same. And that's the nice part about this device is that when we have our hyperangulated blades with that uh, large angle um, blade, we can't use direct, and it almost wants to instinctively have us rock back a little bit. And where we get um, hung up on the airways is that uh, in a grade one view, our camera is so close to the airway that we're too close to be able to manipulate the tube effectively to the cords and then through the cords. Uh, We find that with videoscopic innovation, a lot of times we can get the tube to the cords, but we can't get it through the cords. And so that's manipulation of the laryngoscope and the, um, and the, um, the stylet using a malleable stylet in those situations. And uh, Dr. Levitan has that great idea of straight to cuff, or we say no more than 35 degrees uh, bend on your ET tube. Uh, when you're approaching it. So I think that helps bring it together. The mental mind game that happens is really where we have found the niche and where we fail. And so what it is, is in our brain, we're looking down into the airway, like we're looking traditionally at direct laryngoscopy. And so if you can look down into the airway, you're looking at point A, but the camera is pointing at point B. And that point B is 15 to 30 degrees different from what point A is. And so what happens when we fail and the frustrating part of things is we hit the bottom of the airway and we keep hitting the bottom and we can't get it up into the airway. And then we get frustrated and said, this piece of equipment's horrible. It doesn't work. And then we toss it, right? Well, if we back up a little bit and what we even say is when you enter, enter the mouth, enter it midline or slightly left the center. And then you want to lift when you find your uvula. And that seems like it's far back, and it is, because you want to be farther back and inch your way forward, and millimeters make a difference. You want to inch your way forward uh, and then get a view that's going to be either a grade two or a grade one view that fits exactly what you need to pass the tube through the courts. Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct, obviously. And I I think going through and utilizing the salad trainer that, mm-hmm. that Dr. DeCanto had developed, and, and we obviously employ that at our methods and um, you know, you you start running hundreds of flight crews through that. You start seeing patterns, and I think that was one of the key things. Is is number one, nine times out of ten, if they could not see anything, I would have to assist them or direct them to pull back. They were always way too deep, mm-hmm. and so I think that's the key: is going down left to midline, as you said. I think I misspoke earlier when said said right at midline. Um, a little tired. It's eight thousand feet here. I'm a little lightheaded. <laughs> um, but um, you know, when when you look at that and and you watch the continuous problem, and I even remember doing that the first time because mm-hmm. I, you know I've I've done this for a long time, and so you just go back to what you've always known, and you can't. You almost have to relearn in yeah. some aspects. The thing, and and I, I'm going to say this disclaimer wise, I have no financial ties to CMAC. Have you know? CMAC doesn't even know who I am, but I will tell you, I have tried out all the other video video laryngoscopes, and there is no comparison. And I think, from a business perspective, when you can take a product that's been the standard of care for, I don't even know how long the basic laryngoscope has been around, and you can make that and duplicate that into a video laryngoscope, and the handle, the blade, all that stays the same. That is brilliance right there, Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what they did. Um, And to me, there's no comparison. There's no device that even comes close uh, in giving you the ability, the feel, the handle, the handle side. Everything about it is absolutely phenomenal. 
Um, and I say that from a complete, you know, uh, unbiased uh, position. I just think it's a phenomenal device. Absolutely. You know, um, I will say, again, I, I don't have any financial disclosures as well, but um, the, you you get what you pay for, you know. And um, I always tell people, because people always tell me, what's the best device? What's the best device? The device that's best is what works for your industry and for what you guys can afford. True. So, um, you know, there's other companies like Glidescope, McGrath that are out there that have made normal geometric blades. And I think they're strong in comparison uh, when it comes to a price point. And um, the CMAC, the Glidescope, the McGrath, I think those three um, have really set the tone in terms of the standard geometric blade. Now, there's other ones that are coming out there that are working on things and little improvements here and there. I think we're going to find that um, that the standard geometric approach seems to be the best approach. And again, you're right. I mean, uh, I, I, I love using my CMAC. I love using my Glidescope. And as a researcher and as an educator, I love being able to have the opportunity to teach to all of them uh, equally because they all have their niche and they all work. There is not one device, and I would love to say there's one device that does everything. But unfortunately, different things come up. Like I mm -hmm. said, price points, uh, reusability versus uh, uh, disposable, all these different things come up. And so it adds a, a, a variant to it. And it's just like um, I kind of say you can have a, um, a Honda Accord or you can have a Mercedes. Both are going to get you from point A to point B. It's how you want to ride there. And what you can yeah, afford. That's to a get good there. point. That's a very objective view, and I, I respect that. All right, so let's move back to our heaven criteria and kind of go through the the different variables on on how those are utilized, what they mean, and, and why you came up with those uh, different parts of the overall acronym of heaven. Sure. So heaven criteria. So <laughs> uh, it came with lots of, of discussion and roundtables. And we said, why are people failing? More than anything, why are we unsuccessful at our first attempt? And so we found a couple of things. So the heaven criteria stands for hypoxemia, extremes of size, anatomic disruption and obstruction, vomit, blood, fluid in the airway, exsanguination, and neck mobility and neurologic injury. So those are the pivot points that we have currently for our design. Now, the great part about this criteria is that maybe we fix or improve neck mobility and neurologic injury so well that it's not really a high point anymore in our data analysis. We can take that out and put another thing in there, and we can add that, and we can change the acronym, and, and I'll leave it to Dr. Davis to come up with the fancy words, but uh, we'll find a new acronym, and after five years, it can be updated. And five years later, it can be updated again. So it's ever changing as we progress in airway management. Awesome, awesome. So out of those those data points, so you said that there's a score associated with with it, and, and can you explain if we start at hypoxemia? That's a that's a big that's a big one. Yeah. Um, and you move all the way down to your neck mobility mm -hmm. is. H worth more points than N? No, it's all equal score. Okay. Um, we're working on how we're going to build that scoring system specifically if we want to. What we've found so far in our research is that when you have any one of these uh, criteria, it will make your intubation more difficult, whether it's video or direct, than having no criteria. We found that for a fact. We also found that as you add more of the criteria, so say they're a high, hypoxic patient and they're a lar extremely large patient, when we have those combinations or anatomic disruption, as those numbers increase, so does the opportunity for difficulty. So do you teach based on the, the difficulty? You know, if, if you just have a one of those criteria present mm -hmm. um, versus a patient, as you just said, they're hypoxic, they have anatomic disruption, and let's say they have exsanguination. Is that where you're going to teach to maybe consider video as your first look mm -hmm. over? Can, so can you talk about how you apply the heaven criteria sure. as far as resuscitation and then the overall airway management? Absolutely. So um, a little plug, a shameless plug for our RSI checklist. Um, you know, we uh, talk about preparation and planning. And I think the biggest part of airway management that we've learned over the past couple of years isn't 
uh, so much the device as it is the prep and the planning and how we're going to get there. And I think we really need to focus on fluid resuscitation, blood products, uh, tension pneumothorax, our uh, uh, passive oxygenation. How are we doing that? How are we prepping our patient to give them the longest opportunity available to uh, be successful? You know, there's three things that uh, Dr. Jared Mosier uh, mentioned to me one day, and we were sitting kind of just um, talking back and forth airway stuff. And he said, you know, there's three real reasons why we fail. And the first reason is we didn't prepare. And he's right. We didn't, we, we didn't pre oxygenate We thought it was going to be an easy airway. We walked in there and thought nothing to it. The second reason is we ran out of physiologic time, meaning we intubated or we attempted so long that the patient started to desaturate. We had to stop what we're doing and intubate the patient or and, and bag the patient back up. The last thing is the patient that physiologically cannot maintain to allow us to intubate the patient. And that's your super sick ARDS patient. And he does an incredible lecture about an ARDS patient where that was the case and um, and talks about what he had to do to prepare and the backup to backup to backup to backup plan that he had to have ready for when he attempted to do this intubation. I think that brings up, you know, other other kind of points. And I think as you said, the preparation is huge. I think, uh, you know, I've said it on many other podcasts that we rush in, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I think we have to really slow down. We've got to slow down and evaluate what's going on and remember and fall back on those BLS procedures that we should be mm-hmm. perfect at. Absolutely. But we're so enamored by those advanced procedures and, and that we have to get that airway now. And and I think that's been kind of hammered in our brain Mm -hmm. since the start of, I think, my education. I know it has been and and yours. Um, I think I'm a little out of touch with current paramedic school. Um, But I think that that's the key is that we've seen a change in we don't always go ABCs. We we look at circulation first. And I think that that kind of plays into the heaven criteria. And when you look at cardiac arrest secondary to RSI, it's not that – it could be nothing to do with the providers pro- performing the airway management. They could get first pass attempt. They could passively oxygenate. They could do that. But if they don't resuscitate, resuscitation is not just oxygenation. It's volume. Mm-hmm. It's blood products. It's it's a lot of things. And I so I think you have to look at somebody from a global perspective. You have to slow down, work as a team, communicate effectively, and have a plan coming in. Um. And that's why our patients arrest, no matter what medications, whether it's ketamine, whether it's Atomidate, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're, if they're that sick, if they have, you know, a, a massive hemorrhage, their catecholamine reserves are depleted, their their adrenal insufficient, um, you know, I could go on and on. Mm-hmm. Um, if we don't resuscitate that patient first, we're going to basically knock out any sympathetic drive they have left and they're going to die. Yeah. And so I think that this really, really reminds us to slow down. And that's what I love about the diversity of the acronym. Yeah, you know, and, and it's it's so nice to be able to, like you say, prepare for those things. Um, and then, you know, with the heaven criteria, we have it broken down to when we recommend direct, when we recommend video. Uh, you know, if it was, if we learned that video was everything that we all needed to have, then you would see direct fall out of practice but you don't. And it has to be equal use and you have to be comfortable in both settings. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of talk on social media when, it, when videos first start really getting popular that, well, people are going to lose their technique with direct laryngoscopy. Well, the beautiful thing about these normal geometric blades is that it's the same technique and they can do either technique as necessary. And then with the heaven criteria, we break it down uh, to what we highly recommend in terms of when you're doing your assessment of your airway and looking at the heaven criteria. All right. So let's continue. And when we, when we look at the heaven criteria and we, we use the acronym heaven criteria, can you now break down kind of each category and what you're looking at and maybe how that translates to the provider's choice of, do I go DL first? Do I say, man, this patient is in big trouble or I have, you know, a disruption or I have, you know, secretions, you know, where we can talk about how to deal with that. But what decision making factors go into sure. how you apply that? Yeah. So, 
Um, let's just break it down for how it is. So hypoxemia. We know that evidence-based practice tells us that direct laryngoscopy is faster and more straightforward than videoscopic intubation. Now, when we have an a anatomic difficulty or anything of that sort, videoscopic intubation may be more successful for that. Uh, but again, uh, you know, DL takes it home with that phrase. Uh, extremes of size. So our extremely large patient, the high BMI patient, uh, we want to use our video. We want to go out to in. And what I mean by that is, like I mentioned earlier, where you insert the blade in the mouth, midline slightly left the center. You walk it down until you find your uvula and you lift. And you walk it from the out part, outer part of your airway into your airway. And you expose your epiglottis, lift, and intubate your patient. I jokingly tell our, our uh, clinicians, treat it like a delicate flower. You don't see... Uh, professionals of intubation shaking, muscling it. You don't see them trying to fight the airway. You know, it's it's like our pilots. You know, when you have a pilot jump in the helicopter, there's two pilots. There's one that fights the aircraft and into submission and flies it, and there's one that jumps in the seat and becomes one with the aircraft. And what I want the 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 providers to do is to become one with the with the intubation. So with extremes of size, again, our extremely large patient is out, video out to in. Now with direct laryngoscopy, we can take the idea of burying the blade a little bit and bringing it back. Now, the complication that we have with that, though, is that we can contaminate the, cover, the, the, the lens and we may lose the opportunity for videoscopic innovation at that point. So we have to kind of be cognizant of that if that's the direction we want to go in. So I don't want to stop you, but I do want to kind of touch on that. And I think that goes back to preparation and it goes back to the whole salad trainer mm -hmm. of would you agree that if you are preparing and, and we really push and teach that every innovation, regardless if you see visible secretions, that you are suctioning that Absolutely. airway first. So obviously there's patients that are going to continue to hemorrhage and, and you're going to have an occluded camera. But – in, in my mind, I mean, if you're preparing ahead and you're suctioning every patient and you're making that part of your your initial kind of preparation, mm. a lot of that will be taken care of. Or am I am I am I kind of wrong? You're helping the cause. You're helping make it better. And and so I mean, we've all been there. We get and look into an airway. And we go, man, I need suction. Almost every time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, think to yourself when the last time you had a dry airway, and did the patient receive glycopyrrolate before? Uh, were they prepped? Or is this patient so far decompensated that they're in a cardiac arrest state or some sort of state like that, that we're doing this intubation? You know, even when I was overseas and we were looking at airways overseas in the um, extreme temperatures, you still needed suction and you still had secretions in your airway. <laughs> looking at our, looking at our uh, practice in our data collection, we find that the use of suction is the number one thing that people go, oh, man, I need to use suction. And so Dr. DeCanto had the great idea of making this salad technique where he leads with the suction. Genius. Genius in order to get whatever foreign bodies are in there out of the way, get things going, clearing out the secretions, and optimizing that opportunity for first-pass success for you. And I think really that's, that's a huge thing in terms of videoscopic or direct uh, laryngoscopy that we use that. And it's actually um, a, a part of our heaven criteria where we look at it and go, well, maybe some of the ideas we had with like a bloody airway, maybe we need to reevaluate depending on how the heaven, I'm sorry, the suction uh, and the salad uh, technique takes place. So when we talk about occluding that camera, what, mm -hmm. what do you recommend the providers do in that case? I mean, if... Um, obviously, you're going to have some patients that are hemorrhaging, um, you know, whether that's a, a severe mm -hmm. anatomical disruption, gunshot wound, you know, Lefort's fracture, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so what's your recommendation in that case? So I have to, um, I have to, to mention a case that uh, one of my colleagues had uh, where a truck driver drove into a center divide. And I've had that same case. <laughs> well, he, um, he's a big proponent of the uh, salad technique, and he actually helps Dr. DeCanto teach it across the country. Uh, in that case, the patient, he described it as looking like Predator. Remember Predator, the mm -hmm. movie where the guy's mouth opened up? Yeah. Or the alien's mouth opened up? He said, that's what it looked like. And so exactly what you're saying, blood, Lefort fracture, uh, everything possible. And he said that when he looked at the airway and he got ready to intubate, 
with the videoscopic device, the heaven criteria, and preparing by suctioning first with the salad technique, it made a near disastrous airway much easier. And everybody around felt a lot more calm and relaxed because they used the RSI checklist, the heaven criteria, and this all-encompassing idea came together where this challenging airway, everybody was okay. And so he was able to get that intubation. And so using that suction, you know, to help with that, you're still going to have times where, you know, the patient's just going to be exsanguinating. And we'll talk about that when we get down to that level, uh, you know, and how do we control that? You know, well, we can put the suction back there and, and look for the bubbles or uh, try to expose as best we can where the airway is. And the thing we have to remember is before we provide that first positive pressure ventilation, we should probably consider suctioning the airway. Now, that's kind of interesting because do we want to take away something or do we have the time to do that? At some point, we need to go down there and suction whatever junk is in that airway. And that part, I don't know yet. That's part of, I think that's, that's, that's next. That's one of the next things in our, in our, our bag of tricks that we're looking at. Well, yeah. And I think that leads us into the whole ventilator associated pneumonia Mm -hmm. um, and you know, emergency medicine in general, ER, pre-hospital medicine, we're the, we're the culprits, we're the cause. Mm-hmm. And so we have to understand, and, and I, I really try to think about this and I try to broaden my kind of thought process. That it's one thing to get the patient to the hospital, but if you, if you, if you cause secondary harm to the patient, not, not, not saying that people are doing that on purpose. You know, we, we, we are constantly educating and understanding new concepts, new thought processes based on you know, new evidence-based practice. But if we can alleviate that, you know, and I, I mean, think about the cost reduction. Think about, you know, any study you really look at, it's all about 30-day mortality. Mm-hmm. And so if we can get them to a facility, but then they die because of ventilator-associated pneumonia, ARDS, things like that, then that, that's not good. So I think there's got to be a role. There's got to be – that has to be a primary, a primary concern – um, well, in the, any airway management situation. Yeah. And, and the question is this, and you know, I just thought about this while you were talking is how many patients do we have that we transport that are, have prolonged stay in the hospital, not because of their injuries or their medical issue, but because of something we did like ventilator acquired pneumonia or, uh, pushing something down into that airway where now they have to focus on, uh, uh, antibiotics and keeping them on a ventilator longer. I think you're right. I mean, that'd be, you know, another great study right there. You're giving me all these ideas that I, <laughs> I don't have the time or the energy, but we got a ton of ideas here that we can look at uh, and see that, that truly, you know, if we can improve the process in the beginning, will that help with that 30 day mortality? Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, I, I just want to add, I, I do, I want to, you know, kind of present a, a case to just kind of strengthen um, you know, I've applied these concepts, um, and it was when we first got the CMAC and, and um, had a patient that essentially fell, tripped, and face planted into a retaining wall. Um, she was in a small hospital, and there was, I think, three or four attempts at intubation before we arrived. Um, walked in, and I think, honestly, it was my first intubation with the CMAC. Um, we had, you know, taught the whole suction aspect um, and it literally suctioned the airway. I placed the CMAC in the mouth. I went straight to VL, saw the cords pass the tube, and it was seriously was 10 seconds. And I almost felt bad because I made it look so easy and it was all about the device. Mm-hmm. The whole staff was blown away and it really was – the device. It, it, it was our training. It was the research. And so I, I really feel like it does work. I've used it. I've applied it. And I think um, it, it's phenomenal. You know, you, you have to slow down and you have to identify, you know, what's going to be the difficulty and how can you overcome that difficulty. And some patients, you may go direct to DL. If you have lots and lots of secretions that you can't clear, that may be a patient you go right, right to DL because your, your VLV is going to be blocked. Absolutely. You know, and going and going back to our criteria, our extremes of size, we have our large patient, but for our small patients, we understand a straight blade may be necessary, that the hypoepiglottic ligament isn't completely formed, that omega-shaped uh, uh, epiglottis, uh, or uh, just the path in which needs to be taken for our small patients, our little ones, and, and how we have to do that. 
Uh, I think that's important. And um, you're right. So when you go to the next thing, anatomic disruption and obstruction is exactly what you're talking about. So we say that VL out to in or DL into out. And then we say if it's too bloody or you're having difficulty, direct laryngoscopy may be the more appropriate choice. So you're absolutely correct. Moving forward from that, we have our vomit, but vomit, blood, fluid, and we say DL the strong lift. So we have maybe somebody help us with that. So what do I mean? So what if we do a jaw thrust? What if our partner does a jaw thrust while we're trying to lift and open the airway? What do you think can happen? We have that hyoid bone. It's going to help lift and expose our epiglottis. And so maybe we're in there and it's just a massive patient or our upper body strength is lacking. That If somebody helps us and does that jaw thrust, can that help us assist with that intubation? Well, to add to that, where does, and this is what I've seen just observation-wise, is obviously we've been pushing these concepts. um, But one of the things I I see missed constantly is positioning. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, we've always taught the seven P's of RSI and, and that really is an eighth P is, mm-hmm. is positioning. And so can you kind of talk about the role of positioning in incorporating that into sure. some of these, these patients? Because that's a big deal. Absolutely. You know, it, <laughs> intubation in the pre-hospital setting has, has made so many changes since I first started, even before I started. I remember watching Johnny and Roy and watching different TV shows and watching them intubate behind the toilet of the commode code that we have in the mornings or uh, intubating in the most austere positions. Um, you know, that still is a technique that we have to consider and do uh, with like, entrapped patients and things like that. But we have to recognize also is we'll have more success and better, better opportunities for resuscitation when we have the patient in a uh, seated position as it allows. And so we found that about 30 to 35 degrees is where we want to have our patient. And that aligns our access to allow us to have a better view of our airway. We do seated resuscitation. So we actually bag valve our patient using the thenar eminence technique or the two thumbs up technique. We put our end title on so we see what's happening as we're preparing. Hallelujah. How old am I? I know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we sit the patients up. We do this, right? And then all of a sudden, our angle of axis is in a placement. So our tragus of our ear is to our sternal notch. We... Uh, remove that high BMI on our patients that might be slightly fluffy uh, or um, uh, pregnant. Uh, And so when we sit the patient up, it helps uh, with our lung volume. So we lose 50% of our lung volume when we lay a patient flat. And Dr. Levitan says it great. He said, it's the coffin position. You know what? He's right. Because eventually they're going to be in a coffin. So we sit them up and we do the bag valve ventilation. We sit them up with the end tidal CO2, waveform capnography. We see what happens. We see if they're losing ROSC. We see if they're gaining ROSC. We're seeing if we're bagging appropriately. Are we stacking breaths? Are we uh, bagging at 90 a minute and we need to slow down, you know, and seeing all those things happen. And then when it comes to the intubation itself, We've now, the patient is perfectly placed in where we have them at. Um, You know, it's sad because gone are the days of the behind the toilet intubation. And now we bring the patient to us, not the patient, not us to the patient. How many backs could we have saved by doing that, by putting them in the back of the ambulance and intubating appropriately in the captain's chair? No, I agree. I agree. I think, I think that, uh, you know, obviously there's times where I've had, patients wedged, mm-hmm. you know, where, you know, but I know I agree hundred percent that I think that that is, you've got to set the tone, you've got to set the, the situation and again, be proactive, not reactive, mm-hmm. you know, control the situation, control the setting. Um, so I think those are great points. Yeah. And as, as backboards fall out of um, protocol or practice with, ne- with necessity, I think that also helps uh, talk about that. Now, if we have our patients that are in full C-spine and there's nothing we can do to alleviate that, we need to take in consideration doing like a reverse Trendelenburg procedure and putting that bag under the patient's head uh, and trying to, again, do the best you can to align that access. Um, you know, with the E and exsanguination for our heaven criteria, we say DL is faster and VL with anatomic difficulty. But the last part, the neck mobility and neurologic injury. One of the first papers we did and first papers we looked at years ago and with Dr. Sackles was looking at the effectiveness of a intubated patient or intubating a patient in full C-spine. And we found that there was a 10% increase in first pass success with any videoscopic device versus direct laryngoscopy. And so we find that that's happening, that the VL attempt is gentler and we can treat it like a delicate flower. And the other thing is 
why don't we remove the anterior part of the collar and hold C-spine when we do, when we intubate the patient? Absolutely. You know, you'll increase 20 to 30% of your percentaglottic opening when you do that. And so that grade three view may now become a grade two view. So it now goes from a difficult airway to a good airway. Yeah, and that's been a teaching point. I mean, I think, I know I was always taught that even even back on the ground. And, and But you get so focused in on the whole C-spine aspect. And I think obviously the research has shown that um, and that's why you're seeing the protocols change um, throughout the country of of no spine, long spine boards and, and maybe soft collars and, and, and things like that. But absolutely, you've got to remove that collar and set yourself up for first pass success because ultimately that's that's the key. Yeah, absolutely. What can we do to, to help with that first pass success? Uh, Dr. Sackles wrote a paper looking at complications or adverse events each attempt. And he found that at one attempt, there was about a 14% chance. When you got to that second attempt, it went almost to 50%. And then by the time you got to a fourth attempt, it was almost inevitable that you'd have an adverse event. So that's desaturation, damage to the airway, tension pneumothorax, um, esophageal intubation, uh, just different things like that. So we ran the data, and we're currently looking at it right now. And we have our initial abstract out, and our numbers match what emergency medicine has. So again, it ties together that out-of-operating room experience of the emergent airway. And we see that... We had the same difficulties as the hospital does, as the ICU does, and even the OR does. And then how do we fix those problems to achieve first pass success? All right, excellent stuff. Is there anything else that you've learned based on this database? Um, I know you, you you pull a lot of extrapolate, extrapolate a lot of different data points and, and you, you've got different abstracts that you're really not going to talk about right now. But one of the things I want to kind of talk about is do you, do you stay and play or do you load and go? <laughs> and we've talked about this and I think this is an interesting thing. I've definitely um, changed my thought process on this. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the money making question, isn't it? It's always been, Flight crew, you have to be on the scene 10 minutes and get off, right? Uh, Ken Palazzo uh, and the guys in Northeast, uh, David Stumiller, they did a research in the past that said that when we make those numbers, we can't achieve them. And we start setting expectations that shouldn't be there. And the problem is, yes, we want to be off scene just as fast as the ground crews want us off scene. The problem that we have is that it makes it a, the effect of the patient decline. And what do I mean by that? So we evaluated about 5,000 of our intubations, and we looked at the transport mode versus the stationary mode. So transport mode was moving helicopter, moving ambulance. Stationary mode was scene call, stationary ambulance, stationary helicopter, or in a facility where you're in a room where you're not moving. And we found that, interestingly enough, I thought for sure video was going to do better. I thought for sure I could have put money on it. Our success rates were equal. But here's the trip. Our patients desaturated faster in transport. So we scratched our head and we said, why? Why is that? What, what's going on? Is it the sicker patient? We realized a couple things. What happens in a transport setting? You lose the availability of a set of hands. Mm -hmm. You lose uh, the opportunity to properly pre and proper pre properly prepare. So as Dr. Mosher said, that first fail point, we just screwed up. And then we found that um, sometimes the equipment uh, and what we're doing and the position that we're in isn't the most effective and agronomic for us to be in. Now, if we looked at this data 10 years ago before we had videoscopic innovation, there would be a huge swing. I'm, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure there would be a huge swing with success or a stationary setting versus a moving setting, right? Because we didn't have the opportunity to align that access with the camera that we do now. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing is, is that the added dimension is once you load them in the helicopter, you know, depending on your flight times, I think you can easily become rushed, mm -hmm. and that's where you rush. Uh, and I think the thing that's forgotten is the oxygenation side, mm -hmm. the passive oxygenation side. And I know that's more of a new concept in the last three or four years, um, but that's definitely a, a rushed. And we tend to downplay the preparation. Yeah. And the pre-oxygenation. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and then what did you find as far as percentages go? What was your percentage of desaturation? It's about a 15% increase in desaturation when it was in a moving setting. And so, again, uh, are these patients that were not properly pre-oxygenating 
and we're just trying to get that tube in right away. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's part of it. I think part of it is, um, like you said, we're rushed and we're just not putting the steps together and we're not going down our checklist or not going down our sequence like we do normally in a, in a, in a stationary setting. So um, we're looking at the data at different helicopter models and it just doesn't happen enough now that we've changed that process. I kind of shot myself on the foot. Now that we've changed that process where we focus on intubating on a scene call, um, our intubations in aircraft have dramatically dropped. So now it's hard to get the numbers to make it statistically variable to say this aircraft is better than this aircraft. So <laughs> in saving uh, what we do, I made it harder for our research to happen. But your pre preliminary data, if I'm not incorrect, was that you saw that the bigger aircrafts actually had a higher incidence of desaturation, which you would automatically think of BK-145, you know, these bigger aircrafts, you would have more room. You know, I've flown, as, as you probably have, I've flown in about nine different airframes, mm -hmm. um, but like 206s, 407s, the A stars, um, even the 130, I think are much easier to innovate in than, you know, I feel cramped in a BK. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I mean, sure. you know, if that airway seat, I mean, now obviously, if you position your patient, you sit your patient at 30 degrees, you know, you, mm -hmm. you have a, a great, a great view, but we've just learned that stuff. Right. You know, and so that has changed. You have that patient supine on a spine board. And, and I think that's the key is that not every place in the country has that that autonomy to clear C spines in the field or not put them on a long spine board. Mm -hmm. I can tell you in Kentucky, Tennessee, the south, still to this day, if I go on a flight and I'm even a transfer and this patient has a uh, potential C spine injury and they, the physician says, hey, I cleared to C spine. And we were taking that patient to a level one trauma center. If we don't reboard that patient, mm -hmm. fully C spine that patient, we will – we will not – They it will not be good. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that it really changes how you have to manipulate the positioning aspect. Sure. As you said, put the bag. And, and that's what I was going to kind of say is when he says put the bag underneath, he's saying your airway bag or one of your jump bags. Put something underneath that you're not going to have to access that lifts that board up to where you actually do have that positioning to where you, you know, optimize your, your lung capacity. Um, and uh, put that patient in the right axis. Absolutely. You know, it's um, it's amazing, you know, and I, I know that uh, this is going to cause heartburn for some of our clinicians. Sure. But, um, you know, it's crazy that sometimes the A-star or the narrow model aircrafts are more successful. Why? Because the positioning of the patient, we can get them to a 30, 35 degrees in how we're sitting, and we don't have to lean forward. Mm -hmm. We can sit neutrally. And we can do everything effectively where we get into the 145 and those other ones, you can make it happen, but you have to train for it. And I think the success could be equal in the long run. Again, as preliminary data, we have a lot more to look at. And I think the success could be equal as we properly pre we sit the patient up and we do all those things to get to the airway before we even make that attempt. I think that will help increase the opportunity for success. And so... I'm not saying one aircraft is better than the other. Right. Now, I have my preferences because of what I've flown in, and those are my personal preferences, and that doesn't need to be discussed. But um, it, the, the, the data, the preliminary data was kind of – data was shocking because I thought for sure – that our narrow-bodied aircraft <laughs> would, yeah. would, would, would be a failure. And yeah. man, was I wrong. Yeah. You know, I think that it leads to another discussion, and, and I just want to hit on it real quick, is, is – you know, the whole adage of getting off scene quick, um, you know, we're, we're critical care providers and, and the air medical uh, industry is looked at as, as that. But we're also a rapid means of transport, and I think mm -hmm. it's very easy to cloud that, but we have to do what's right for the patient. So if you have ground crews, if you have areas that are frustrated um, with maybe longer scene times, you know, and we're not saying that you need to be on scene for 30, 40 minutes. But if you extend your scene time an extra 10, 15 minutes because you need to secure the airway, it comes back to education. And that's where you need to do outreach education to these ground crews. Uh, so I want to have you just really briefly before we wrap this up talk about the, the RSI checklist. And we talked about this in the podcast we did at ECHO um, with Ryan Wyatt. And that RSI checklist, that's a great tool to introduce to the ground crews, uh, have them involved and explain, hey, this is why. This is why we're doing this. Absolutely. This is why we, we may be on scene an extra 10 or 15 minutes, not because, you know, we want to sit here and, and play, but all the data is showing this. And I think if we 
I think people are objective. And if you explain why you're doing something and, and I, and I feel that way, 99% of the people out there are going to feel that way. They're going to understand if you explain it. And that's just based on me teaching almost a thousand people this year that sure. if you explain a new concept to somebody and you explain it in a way they understand and they can grasp, it's good. It's, it's a, it's a miscommunication. They just don't understand. They don't know. Sure. And so they, they have a knee jerk reaction and then you have a big PR nightmare. Yeah. And so we have to be the ones to be proactive and, and fix that problem. Absolutely. You know, the RSI checklist, uh, I'm so excited and so proud of it. Um, there are a lot out there and I'm not saying mine's the, the be all catch all. Everyone has a, a checklist. When we first started ours, <laughs> ours was three pages long. Yeah. I remember. And <laughs> I went, Whoa, how am I supposed to make this easy to use? And there were a lot of great ideas on that checklist and we kind of tabled it. And then, um, you know, I've told this story before, but human factors came into play. And uh, I mentioned my fiance uh, as a type one diabetic and she was a GM of a restaurant and she was working 80 hours a week and new baby and all these things came into play and short story or short version, um, human factors came in new baby, new environment, new stressors. She got complacent cause she was tired and she grabbed the wrong insulin and she gave herself the wrong insulin. And I woke up to her seizing in the bed with a blood sugar of 24. And so, um, that really made me reopen my eyes again and go, well, what happens when we catch a flight or we get called on a ground call, uh, ER, whatever, is everything right in the world? No, something's going on. Our kids are fighting about homework. The dog chewed up some papers. Uh, your car is broke down, whatever the case may be, but there's always stressors. And what I found was with this RSI checklist, it helps make those factors fade away for a minute. Okay. And when we use this, the great thing that we do is we hand this to the ground provider. We hand this to somebody that can read. Because one, we want to have the inclusion of somebody else involved. We want to be a team. The flight crews, we want to be teams with our ground providers. We want to be teams with the nurses in the hospital. This checklist is being used in the hospitals. It's being used on the on the aircraft. It's being used internationally uh, and throughout the throughout the, the world. And where they're using this, where anesthesiologists are taking this to ICUs when they do resuscitation and they're handing it to the nurse and they're saying, read this checklist and they're going over it. And it's a check and balance. Uh, you know, it started with the groups in Australia and the flight crews down there of having that uh, closed loop communication. So when they say monitoring equipment, yes, it's on and in place. And so we're doing the same thing. And so it's a back and forth thing. And again, that's the part where um, it shouldn't be your partner. Because you'll start getting selection bias. You will you know that your partner sets up suction every time under the patient's head and everything's good to go. And then you just skip that step. And then your patient, your partner doesn't put suction up. So that helps prevent that selection bias. And then working together as a team. And what we found is that there were some complaints saying, well, an RSI checklist takes too long. Well, it actually streamlines things because it prevents those mitigating factors that could come up as bad outcomes. Uh, and it helps uh, deter those. At the same time, uh, it's a check and balance for experts to know what they're doing. Pilots use checklists, mm -hmm. operating rooms checklists, and this is an ongoing debate that we hear all the time. But I feel that it's appropriate to utilize a checklist to make sure we're doing the right thing and to optimize the opportunity for first pass success and optimize the opportunity for better patient care. No, and I agree. I think it's it's been very well received and um I think, you know, you, you worked really hard on it. I was in part of those meetings there at the end of, and sat through days of going through that list and, and, you know, all the different opinions. And I think it, it, it got down to the core, mm -hmm. you know, points. So that's really, really cool. So let's wrap this up and kind of talk about, um, I know you've spoke on this topic in, in many arenas, um, mm -hmm. whether that's in the United States, I know you just spoke on this in Columbia. Is that correct? You've been to <laughs> yeah. Ireland. Yes. Um, and so how has the, physician side because i think that's where we always obviously the the air medical um or the ems side medical director side they understand what we do sure there's no there's no competition there's you know i think for the most part you know there's a cohesive team but other than that i think it, it it's it's more it's not competition between paramedics and nurses and and nurses and doctors it's we don't understand what each discipline does. Absolutely. And so how have the physicians that you've spoke on, how have they taken this data? Because a lot of times you're at these conferences and you're the only paramedic there. Yeah. 
and you're speaking to anesthesiologists, right? These guys that have had 12, 14 years of education on a specialty. Yeah. And, and so that's really cool. I can see that that can be intimidating. That can be very nerve wracking. So how has that, how's that reception been? Um, wow. <laughs> it, it, it is intimidating. Um, but I'm so passionate about it and I know how right it is that I'm comfortable talking about it. Um, the ear of the physician has vastly opened over the years. And I'm so excited to be able to collaborate with physicians, anesthesiologists, emergency medicine doctors, to be able to collaborate and discuss the pros and cons of what we do. And we've changed practice. Our practice started because of physicians and what they've done. And we can never forget that. And I think now with that collaboration of building that out of operating room airway management, I think we can come back into it and say, here's what we've learned where we're at. And how does that change things? Uh, you know, presenting it in, in, in Columbia was, was a huge honor, huge honor just, um, just be, you know, to, to be able to speak to nine other countries down there and talk about what we're doing in the United States and what's working and, um, and kind of enlighten the eyes of what the critical care provider or the paramedic is doing out there. And I have to tell you that, um, you know, so much respect to Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, uh, Chile. Uh, Brazil, Peru, all those guys, uh, and the countless others that are aggressively trying to change practice and improve on that. And I think it's with the physicians opening and understanding that we know we can we can probably help out and we can do something to help. Now we're not going to ever say that we're experts in this. You know, I think we do a very good job in collaborating. But you're right. Those guys have 14, 15, 20 years of experience of specifically looking at that in a day in and day out procedure. We make it a little bit different because we have to challenge ourselves in cars and different things like that. But in some settings, the anesthesiologist goes out to those calls with them, mm -hmm. right, and helps out with it. So I think it's a collaboration. Uh, the Society of Airway Management has been huge with this. And so the Society of Airway Management is a conglomeration of uh, doctors, uh, nurse anesthetists, uh, CRNAs, all those uh, people, and pre-hospital providers now, and where uh, we all work as a team and we talk about things, and we talk on an even level, and it's intimidating. You're absolutely right. To see the people that write the papers, the people that I studied growing up, to see those names to be across the room, and to have them, when you come up with an idea, with them agree and go, hey, that's great. That's so cool. And that's where we're at today, where we can talk pre-hospital we can talk as a paramedic, as a nurse, and work together. And I think, you know, that this doesn't work just for, for, for medicine, but as a society right now. You know, we need to work together more. And um, I think that's a step in the right direction. Well, and I think that, you know, you brought up another point, and I think that's always been a, a point of contention with our industry is, is you have nurse versus paramedic. You have you know, physicians against nurse or physicians against paramedic. And it comes back to, you know, a, a big pissing match. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, that's one of the things that I, I find I'm most proud of about the Flatbridge Ed podcast is that we have listeners from all genres. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully through the education, we've, we've, we've broadened that perspective to where when I have a medical director or I have a physician, I just saw on Twitter before you came in here, a, a medical um, – um, actually, she's not a medical director. She's a flight physician for Uni University of Wisconsin, um, plugging the podcast to multiple people saying these guys know what they're doing. And so to get that confirmation from a physician um, is, is amazing, and I think we all have a role in mm -hmm. patient care. And so that's the key. If you're a physician you have 14 years of experience in, in just the education side – Paramedics, you know, based on what you've done, um, you know, you have a couple of years, maybe four years, maybe maybe more based on what you're doing. Um, nurses, the same thing. But we all have a specific role. We both we all have a a, a niche, mm -hmm. and we have a different perspective. And I think you saying that we're not experts that was a humble response. You are an expert, and I think I don't care if it's a doctor, anesthesiologist. A, a, a subspecialty of, of any kind, they have to respect that. And I think being objective and, and listening to what you're having to what you're doing, the data doesn't lie. And that's the key thing. The data doesn't lie. That's where I've had to change my thought processes. 
I may have a view based on my experience, but my experience and my perspective is just solely based on that. Mm-hmm. And data doesn't lie. Yeah. You know, if your bank account says you have five dollars, you have five dollars. <laughs> right. True. You may have grandeur that you have a thousand dollars, but that's not the case. And so the data doesn't lie. And I think that that's the amazing thing is you're broadening, you know, not only our industry, but, you know, kind of the perspective of all medical disciplines that deal with emergency medicine. And I think that's what I love. And I hope that we're doing the same thing with the Flat Bridget podcast as well as is building that cohesive team um, and, and kind of bridging those gaps. Absolutely. You know, it's, um, it, it, it's so amazing to when I first started doing research, uh, Dr. Sackles took me under as one of his uh, research assistants and taught me the way, you know, and taught me airway. And I was so fortunate to have that. As I spread from there and tried to continue research, I got a lot of no's. I got a lot of that's not a good idea or a determines. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't from any specific person. It was just kind of the flow. And where we're at today, Flight Bridge Ed being one of the most popular podcasts and what we're doing on a multidisciplinary level – um, going out there now and um, being able to talk to a physician-led group and being able to collaborate with them, and not just as myself, but as you, as uh, as Tyler, as uh, as, every, as Bruce, as everybody else has, has been able to um, allow that to happen for us to in, in increase in what we're doing. All right. Well, I think that's a that's a great podcast. Do you have anything else you want to touch on before we uh, wrap this up? I just want to say, uh, you know, it's been an honor and pleasure to uh, talk and work with everybody here. And uh, it's great when, you know, I'm wearing the Flight Bridge Ed shirt, walking around the airport or walking around town, and people stop me and they go, oh, my gosh, Flight Bridge Ed, I love it. Or, oh, Eric, or whatever. And it's uh, it's pretty awesome uh, to to have that recognition both nationally and internationally uh, in what this uh, program is doing. And it's great to see uh, where we're at and uh, – and I really appreciate all the uh, the help. Well, I mean, I think when you when you look at any product, any business, obviously this isn't didn't start as a business, like I've said many many times. But obviously, having the podcast grow and continue to grow, and and all of our peers share the podcast with their friends and their coworkers, I think that's that's cool, and I love that, and I, you know, I think that's very humbling. I think I I really um, I love what you said earlier, where you talked about EMTs recognizing the brand and other physicians and physicians actually recognizing the brand and wanting to be a part of the brand. I think obviously you want your peers to accept you and accept what you're doing, but we can, when you can have, um, you know, physicians, higher trained people, um, want to listen to your education and want to, um, you know, share that education with their, with their staff, with their employees or with their other colleagues. I think that that's a, that's a great, great feeling. And so, um, just hope we can continue to put out material that's that's relevant and that we continue to grow. Um, as always, if you have any cases, if you have any ideas for cases or podcasts, uh, please feel free to email me at eric.bauer at flightbridgehead.com. Looking for a review course? Check them out. We have course dates all the way through November 2018 right now. And uh, we just want to thank you for um, you know, trusting us and, and coming to our classes. Uh, until next time, we'll talk to you soon. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education.